Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our previous panel, and thank you all for sticking around and hopefully got you know your steps in and stood for a bit. Don't get any blood clots in your leg. I always get that reminded from my watch, but. Um, thanks also to our previous panel um, for just kind of highlighting the need for trust in our elections. You know, it's you know important in any democracy and especially in the republic that we work in, uh, we live in. You know, to have trust in your election systems, trust in your ballot being counted, and um, I think that's such an important thing. So I want to thank our panel on that. And so I'm excited. I'm Anthony Lamarena. Um, I'm on our federal affairs team at the R Street Institute, and I'm excited to introduce our next panel. Um, you know, I work on a plethora of different issues at R Street. I like to say cops, contraception, and the National Flood Insurance Program is my day to day. Um, but I'll be introducing a panel that focuses on the first one, uh, which is cops. Uh, and it's a very important issue to us here at R Street with our criminal justice program. You know, we work on criminal justice reforms, uh, you know, everything under the sun from policing uh, to reentry issues. And policing is something that's kind of near and dear to our heart, especially with our policy director's background as a retired NYPD uh, police officer. And so trust also bleeds over into our public safety uh, professionals and just into our pub public safety and criminal justice system. You know, we want to trust that when we're walking down the street, we feel safe. And so ensuring that is an important thing and, you know, ensuring the support of, you know, the community, you know, being able to support the community and being able to be support law enforcement aren't mutually exclusive. You can do both and go hand in hand. And so that's what we like to work on here at R Street. And that's why this panel is so important and essential. Now, granted, the folks on the panel, are, a lot of them are cops, and so it, we might get a little bit colorful in our language compared to the first few panels, but you'll have to, you know, <laughs> indulge them. And so moderating this wonderful panel uh, will be Diane Goldstein, who's an ex the executive director for the Law Enforcement, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. We have Tracy Kazee, who's president and chief operating officer uh, for the Center for Police Equity. Uh, we have John Jaron K. Smith, who's the former deputy assistant to uh, the president for the White House Domestic Policy Council and the Office of American Innovation, and also a co-author of this wonderful book, um, Underserved, Harnessing the Principles of Lincoln's Vision for Reconstruction for Today's Forgotten Communities. And you can go back into that corner and get one of these, a copy of one of these as well. And last but not least, introducing our criminal justice's fearless leader, uh, Jillian Snyder, who's policy director for our criminal justice and civil liberties program. And so please give them a wonderful, warm, and round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, first of all, you know, Anthony, I have some words for you because you stole my line already, okay? <laughs> but really, th this panel is meant to be a really important conversation about police accountability and legitimacy. I spent almost 22 years in policing in Redondo Beach in California doing tons of multi-agency task force work. and gang work and I ran a narcotics team and I retired as a lieutenant and was a division commander of multiple divisions at the time. And what I always recognize that if our community didn't trust us, that we didn't solve crime. So the best work I always did was based on it didn't matter if you were a suspect or a victim, compassion, dignity, trust, and how do we, A, prevent crime, or hold people accountable in a way that is not based solely on retribution? And coming out of California policing is what I, what I do know is that there's this misconception about California being this real liberal state. Not when it comes to the criminal justice system, though, is from mandatory minimums to our drug policies to our bloated prison system. In California right now, it costs the state, the taxpayer, over $104,000 per year to incarcerate one person in Department of Corrections. At the county jail level, I think that the last figure I saw was something over 50000 And so what I want to do and what our organization is trying to do is really smart on crime policies, right, Jerome? is we're trying to reduce the footprint of policing while supporting victims, ensuring that we attract the best police officers to really a noble profession. And so we're going to be talking about this. And so I, 
I, I just really want to state that our best policing is done when we attract the best and brightest people who want to build community trust and serve others. This creates legitimacy that allows us to work as partners, not from a place where law enforcement and the criminal justice system has done it a lot, very top down. We're the cops, we know how to define public safety and we don't need anyone else to tell us how to do it, which is really wrong. And so it's important for us to partner with our constituents to solve crime, to find innovative, forward-thinking solutions that create and improve community health and safety by building infrastructures and resources to prevent and reduce crime. We need not just the police. We should demand good policing that recognizes community safety is a multifaceted challenge requiring collaboration from all stakeholders. And so I think this is what I'm so excited about this panel because I think the work of Jerron, Tracy, and Jillian all build on that. So Tracy, I'm going to start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, what CP is doing, and your vision for policing for the future. Well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Tracy did it! <laughs> First of all, thank you to R Street for the invitation. I'm Dr. Tracy Kazee, and I'm one of the co-founders, COO, and president of the Center for Policing Equity. My background is in policing, 25 years with the Denver PD, and then on to the NYPD as the Deputy Commissioner of Training and the Deputy Commissioner of Equity and Inclusion. I would tell you that the work of CPE is one that is grounded in science. It is what we do. So we believe that evidence-based work is the best way to approach what we're all trying to do. And that is not just reducing the footprint, of policing, but we know that policing in themselves are responding to social ills that they have no really responsibility to respond to. And so how do you get everyone else to come to the table when it comes to, especially those most vulnerable communities, to their needs? What does that look like and what does that mean? And for us, we do that in a number of ways. We absolutely partner with law enforcement. Background wouldn't allow me to do it any other way. Uh, we center those most vulnerable communities because those closest to the issue have the best solutions for the issues, and we often don't do that. We often do it after the fact. So your last question, I think, was what? Oh, now you're going to make me think I about am. Oh, I goodness. Am. Is what do you foresee for the future of policing? And, and how do we, you know, we talked about polarization, I've heard on all the panels, and I think policing is very polarized right now, right. both between the communities <laughs> And law enforcement, you know, it, it, I, I jokingly say is our organization must be getting it right because we piss off everyone. We piss off the cops, we piss off activists, and we say, you got to have accountability for policing. We can transform policing, but what's it going to look like? So right. how would you transform policing, Tracy? So we've been transformed a number of times, have we not, Jillian? Um, as far back as I can remember from 1989. And I think what we have to really take into consideration is that the needs of specific communities are different. And when we often try to sort of do a layover, cookie cutter approach to communities, we miss the mark. So the one thing about policing, um, and I'll, so let me back up a little bit. So policing is in a identity crisis right now like no other I've never seen. And the question really is, what should we be doing and what should we not be doing? So when I think about policing and I think about law enforcement, I think about safety, the very first fundamental thing we have to do is make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, because we're not. The definitions are very different. Um, and we need to make sure that we have a common definition about what we're talking about and what we're trying to achieve. But policing itself really needs to be disentangled from other systems that have failed and are failing. And in order to do that, you really need to sit down and figure out what types of things, and we all hear the conversations about crime going up. In some areas, it's not. Some areas, it's property crimes. In some other areas, it's crimes against persons. But what we really have to start asking ourselves is what is the role of policing in our communities? And what do we want that to be? And it may not be the same, depending on which community you live in, and that is OK. And I think it was said earlier that mutually, things happening at the same time is quite all right. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But for policing to look different, there has to be an acknowledgment that people are experiencing policing very different, depending where you are. But starting there, you really have to begin to look at, and this is what we do at CPE, are what are the needs? 
I can tell you when we analyzed 911 calls, about three to four percent of those calls were what we call true crime calls. And that means that you actually are calling 911 because you need to see someone with a, the, not only the authority to make, some, uh, make a difference, but to actually come with some type of force if needed. The rest of those calls are social service needs. And we have entangled policing into delivering on everything everybody needs at the dial of three digits. That is a problem. So for me, it looks like this. If you have someone that is in mental health crisis and is not violent, then that police are not the ones who should be showing up. If you have someone who has a history of violence and having a mental health you know, crisis, then a cold response team is more appropriate than anything else. But if you have someone that is having problems with housing, with jobs, and just really having other, any other issues that are not law related, then police should not be responding to those calls. But to get people to understand why that is important, especially for those of us who've been in uniform, really don't understand that when you task someone with something they're not equipped or trained to do, and the only type of equipment they have will prevent or give you an outcome that is gonna be on the news, then we are not defining it in the same way. So for me, it looks that way. Have a good definition, make sure you understand what we mean by policing, who gets to define it, what it means, and then how do you respond from there? You know, Dr. Heathy, that I always go into legislators' office, whether they're Congress, state, or, or local, and one of the first things I always tell them is a law, no matter how benign it may appear on its surface, a red zone, something else, is remember that outside of the military here in America that the only people that are allowed to use state-sanctioned power and violence is we in law enforcement. And when you engage in lawmaking, you really need to think about unintended consequences and what's going to happen. So when we create laws, we should be creating laws that have outcome studies, That's correct. sunset clauses, that should really look at are we trying to solve that problem that that law created. And I think that can be problematic. So Absolutely. And I would also say to legislators is go back and learn the history of whatever law you're either trying to tweak <laughs> or the one you don't know, because you know Jamon's cracking up. But, but it's true, it's right? True. And oftentimes, policy is good to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But you also have to understand the history of how all these things came about. And, you know, and when we talk about policing and we talk about how communities are, are segregated, we, we'd look to redlining, mm -hmm. right? That was legal. But we, it also had an unintended historical consequence. So when you're going in, and even, you know, and I live in rural Colorado, and even with my commissioners, as we sit down and try to figure out, you know, the whole path of Elizabeth, Colorado, shout out to them, was that we were not gonna grow and expand. Right? Yet we look over the horizon and we've got houses popping up everywhere and you have to ask yourself, if we made that statement, how do we end up here? That's right. And not going back to examine things that we may have needed to undo historically without, you know, before we move forward, we're never done. So you have developers and people coming in under old legislation, old loopholes, and doing just that. They're popping up everywhere. So the need to go back and to look at what has been tried, done, not measured, is huge before you go forward with anything else. Jerome, you work uh, currently for Right on Crime. You do some consulting for them too, yes, right? Yes, I'm a senior fellow there. And, and so, you know, from your conservative perspective, can you talk about the work that you do and alternatives to policing and how to, like, write the system where it's accountable, transparent, actually reduces crime? Most importantly, though, is gives people second chances and opportunities. Sure. So let me back up a bit. You know, um, so I, I worked 10 years in Congress, and so I certainly know what you're saying about uh, just putting legislation together and not doing the research around it. Happens a lot. Um, some members even do me messaging bills, and they don't right. even really plan to pass it. They just want to talk about it. Mm. Say, I have a bill. You know, um, the other piece is, is that when we make legislation, they don't always consult with the admin, so they don't get the technical assistance from DOJ, and then sometimes politics gets involved with that, and DOJ maybe not, not want to talk to the Hill staff when they're trying to solve a problem. Um, but it's very complicated, but going back to your earlier discussion around trust, um, trust being the hardest issue when trying to get history and trying to figure out how to solve these problems. Um, before people give information to you, they want to know that you're not going to use that um, against them. Um, and so I think in working on these issues, you know, people do, do need to spend some time listening 
to each other um, and trying to find common ground. And I found that to be um, the North Star of what helped me negotiate um, the First Step Act into law. Um, and it wasn't, of course, just me. It was a number of individuals um, willing to come to the table and listen and find common ground. And we were able to kind of build that out um, over time. Um, but as it relates to just um, system reform overall, that same methodology should be applied. And that's what I wrote about in my book, Un Underserved, is that we have to kind of be very intentional about the problem we're trying to solve. So it's good to define um, what is police, you know, how can we make it better, and what's the point, right? right. Public safety. And so when you talk about my role at, um, um, you know, right on crime, you know, our approach from conservatives and what we call smart on crime policy is reforming our system or, or moder modernizing our system in a way that protects public safety. You know, we, unlike any other reform, there's direct consequences to doing this wrong, as you alluded to. You know, um, lives can be lost, um, um, vic victims can be created as a result of bad policy that we put in place. Um, but our uh, system has a lot of issues in it, and it's not all on the police either. Right. You know, um, when you mention criminal justice system, that involves the DA, that involves the judges, um, and it certainly involves the community. And so when we're trying to craft <clears throat> solutions, we also have to realize that these issues are very local in nature. Um, and I, I worked on stuff on the federal level, and the biggest issues are, are local. Mm -hmm. We have millions of people in the um, prison systems, and crimes happen on an everyday basis. Um, most people in the federal systems are, you know, white collar crimes um, and things like that. Uh, you know, and so I think that um, as we approach it from a, um, a conservative point of view, is keeping in mind that it's public safety, um, and these things are intertangled with each other. So. You know, um, you don't really get public safety without education, opportunity, economic development, behavioral health. And uh, I, I feel as though we put all this stuff just on the justice system itself and right. don't look at some of the root causes. But then there's others who just look at the root causes and don't look at the public safety element. And I think that that's where we have to have the nuance and we have to take the politics out of public safety and reforming or modernizing our justice system. And so what we've done with a coalition that I started um, uh, called Public Safety Solutions for America is identify four principles that we think brings people together. First principle is fund the police. Um, now you may think that's just like the opposite of defund the police, but it isn't. It's that the current system has perverse incentives mm -hmm. for police officers to go towards certain crimes, right. um, traffic stops, civil asset forfeitures, because fines and fees sometimes fund their police departments. Right. Um, they're also uh, uh, very much behind, even before the George Floyd, with recruitment and retention. Um, then if you talk about mental health um, of police officers, or even doing a profession and making a decent That's living, right. Right. Is, is, is a struggle, um, especially if you're in major metropolitans like New York or Miami, where you can't really afford to even live in the city. Secondly, um, just to speak to your point, uh, police spend too much of their time on the social work issues and three to four percent of their time on solving violent crime or even preventing violent crime. Right. And so um, as it relates to that, and this feeds into our third principle, evidence-based policies that lower violent crime, you know, we got to use data analytics and be very nuanced on how we figure out what works with these COBRA responder models. And then, you know, evidence-based policy, we've seen places that have done really good work on public safety. Uh, when I was at the major city chiefs convening last week, we spoke with Anton Lucky, a former blood in Dallas, Texas, and Chief Garcia, who both formed a partnership um, that helped lower violent crime in Dallas. And so right. Dallas being the fourth, one of the fourth um, major metropolitans in the nation, actually have seen a dip in violent crime as a result of them having that partnership. But that chief is also doing things like uh, uh, hotspot policing, um, uh, cleaning up blight in the community, you know, um, and then offering alternatives to crime. Um, and he's working with his mayor, and he's also working with his DA. And so that 
type of relationship has created the, um, the best environment. And then, of course, our fourth principle is, um, again, smart on crime policies, which is also based off of um, public safety, but evidence that works. And so in that coalition, and all of the members up here are on I'll the coalition with me, um, I've been on the ground and went into communities where it's not quite working, and the broken piece is that they have no trust from the community. Yep. Um, the communities don't trust that law enforcement is gonna work with them. And sometimes law enforcement doesn't folk, um, work, um, don't think they can work with the community leaders. I mean, I, I'm not even gonna say what chief it was, but after talking to Anton Lucky, he was like, yeah, I work with um, plenty of violence interrupters. Like three of them we just sent back to jail. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, that's, that's not the Anton Luckys of the world. You know, the Anton Luckys of the world have actually changed their whole life around and are actually become pillars of the community. And you can do amazing things with them. Um, there's a guy named uh, Ron Moten here in Washington, D.C., um, who's done a piece of Horlick's work. Um, but even the work that he did to lower violent crime in D.C. has been rolled back because of the funding um, that they had for their police department. Yeah, you, you know, it's so interesting when we start talking about funding. You said something about perverse incentives. And clearly, you know, that's alluding to fines and fees, but I, I think about liberty issues like civil asset forfeiture reform. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work on that, both at, at the state and at the federal level, and, and I sit there and I think about how even the attorneys who created civil asset forfeiture reform today say that it has been so corrupting of law enforcement, and we've been working with them with a variety of co coalition partners to overturn it. And so, you know, um, Jillian, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you because you're doing a lot of really super interesting work um, with our street on this issue, is also trying to find that, that balance. You know, how do we create communities that are holistic? How do we redefine what public safety means? And I know we, t we tend to use that word a lot, but I think from my perspective, I really think that sometimes it excludes the community when we talk about it. So I always try to define public safety as community health and safety. And how do we engage, not just with the cops, the communities, but legislators and the work that, that you guys are doing on this, these issues, Jillian? So, well, first I'm gonna start with the civil asset forfeiture because we, Sarah and I, Shout out, Sarah. Um, <laughs> we just had um, an op-ed published a couple of weeks ago on civil asset forfeiture. Um, we know why civil asset forfeiture was created, and it was well intended, to be honest with you. Um, we were trying to break up organized crime rings. We were trying to seize the property that they were using um, when they were committing you know, interstate violence. And now law enforcement, unfortunately, has become reliant on that money, and that's, that's troublesome. It makes people question, okay, so the cops are gonna seize my stuff. I don't even know if I'm gonna be found guilty, um, but then how am I gonna get my stuff back? And there's a lot of animosity around civil asset forfeiture because the, the agency shouldn't have to rely on that for sustainability to fund themselves, um, to create programs, to work with the community. Um, so that's an issue all in itself. Um, but now your other question. What was, how, how do we create holistic partnerships that really make everyone part of stakeholders. I mean, I, you know, I know when we were, when I was working was 1983 to 2004, the height of the drug war. You know, we, our agency and, and many of the agencies that I worked with, federal, state, and locals were very much, wow, we don't ask the community, you know, how they want to be policed. You know, they can't tell us what to do. And I'm so happy to see that that shift has finally started to occur where we recognize we actually have to have partners. Well, you, and it's so different. Like, I worked in NYPD, and NYPD, the way we interact with the community is probably very different how you did in Denver, how you did mm -hmm. in Redondo Beach. You need to look at your um, constituents that are living in your community. You need to look, realize at the local level, what are the needs? What are the crime needs? Um, what does my community expect from me? And I think that we're starting to see a big shift. Even, I mean, I'm not that old. We talked about that this week. But when I started, um, it was, you know, the height of stop and frisk. Um, that was like, you have to go out and stop five people today. I was like, what if there, I don't see five bad guys today? <laughs> like, what do I do? You don't always see a bad guy every shift. Um, but it wasn't like, it was like, go get a collar, go write your summonses, go do your stop and frisks. And then you were alienating yourself from the community. When they saw you, they weren't, oh, yay, the cops are here. They were like, oh, man, the cops are here. And we are starting to see 
a trend in some um, communities and some organizations that are culturally starting to say, you know what, I need to work collaboratively with my community. I need to welcome them in. I want to hear what they think. I want to know who they know. Because guess what? Who's your biggest asset? The community. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try and tell law enforcement agencies that I work with. That's why I try and tell legislators that we are um, involved with. But I think we're starting to see some positive momentum that the community and the police they can't fight this alone. They need to come together. You know, for, for years, I think that <clears throat> um, we've been purposely siloed away from other systems that are more efficacious than policing and preventing crime, right? And so I look at governance is part of the big failures of mm -hmm. the criminal legal system. Um, you know, whether it was unintentional or in some cases intended, is this is where, where we have gotten. And Tracy, you said something so interesting because I, I, I was preaching this back when I was a, a division commander. We have to start telling people no. Mm -hmm. We're not responding to that type of call. That is not a law enforcement call. Or worse yet is is the discretion of like the 911 systems. You know, it is police agencies, police dispatchers. Most people don't understand have no discretion. If you call, you get a cop. You don't get a mental health worker. You, there's no. And um, when I was a, a sergeant, I, I remember very clear one of the biggest issues in in our city. We had multi million dollar homes right on the beach, two Section Eight housing great uh, tourist area, but we would perpetually get these calls from our citizens that were racist in nature or anonymous, and they would send cops, and I as a supervisor basically would have to get on the air and say, no, we are not sending a cop to a suspicious person call just because he's a male black sitting on the beach at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. That's not going to happen. And so um, how do we educate not just our cops, but our citizens that we serve, that if we tell you no, we're not coming, that doesn't, that, it, that doesn't mean that we're not willing to work with you, but this isn't a police issue, if we don't have those other infrastructure in place. So how do we get that, the other infrastructure up and going so we have places to send people to, so to speak? So one big project that we weren't successful at doing when I worked in the Trump administration was um, creating a, a 21st century um, Johnson Commission. Mm -hmm. um, that has always been something that's very much needed. It got really tied up into the uh, criminal justice reform and the first step back and very politicized on what it looks like as a commission. Um, and as a result, uh, we end up doing something in the executive order, but not something as robust as the Johnson Commission. And for those who don't know what the Johnson Commission is, you know the Johnson Commission under Lyndon B. Johnson was organized around law enforcement, and they came up with the police academies, and they came up with the 911 system. And that type of um, robust leaning into, um, in a bipartisan way, kind of um, reformed or reimagined the way we did policing. You know, and like 911 is just like something you go to. So I think in order to do something bold like that, we'll have to kind of have something as big as the Johnson Commission, um, and leveraging technology. Um, because also technology, um, especially with cell phone and data, you can get better information and give better information to our police, and also um, better information to partners, um, especially if you're talking about co-responders um, or other ways to kind of deal with issues. Um, the challenge we go into is that like you don't want to get that uh, boy who cry wolf piece, and then you don't show up to yeah. a situation where police needed to be involved. Um, however, with all the data analytics we have, um, I feel that if we have a thoughtful conversation that brings the right um, uh, people to the table, and, and not just the police officers, um, but the, the health and human services, mm -hmm. you know, um, everything uh, around you know, the, the DAs, you know, um, defense attorneys, and, and looking at how we're doing our justice system. Because right now, you know, one out of three people have a record. 
You know, um, and that also brings in the private sector. Like, where are you getting your employers from? Because That's last thing I saw, there's a work shortage. Yep. You know, um, and we also know there's a correlation between uh, being able to actualize and not be in trouble and having a job, having a living wage job. So all of these things are interrelated. Um, and we also have, you know, the faith community, nonprofit community that can play a huge role in helping people deal with things like trauma. Um, trauma-related care. Um, the one thing that uh, the AGs have told me over and over again that like it's not like the war on drugs. A lot of the violent crime and stuff that you're seeing is um, disputes or, or beef mm -hmm. um, perpetrated by uh, um, social media, yep. um, which brings a, a whole nother dynamic. Um, but this is an issue that we cannot <laughs> kick the can down the road on, which is why um, me and a lot of our coalition leaders have been leaning into going to communities, learning what's working, and trying to figure out how we can um, build a broader coalition towards reform that's not conservative or Democrat, but that's American. Well, I, I think policing should be a nonpartisan issue, and I think all of us agree on that, and yeah. yet here we are right. in this, again, very polarized state, and you know, it, it, it again, I'm gonna go back to California and all the work I do there, boy, my, Old cop friends are like, oh my God, you're the devil incarnate because you want to stop pretextual stops for non-safety, you know, violations. And, and, it, and it's so interesting, but when you start really digging down deep, it's like, hey, do you want to respond to these calls? And they're like, well, no. It's like, mm -hmm. these are the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to get you to do real policing again, which is why you signed up, right? It, Jillian. Thinking about 21st century policing, how do we pull all the law enforcement kicking, you know, and screaming into 21st century policing, and and have them understand the importance of their legitimacy that that things can't continue as they're going. We need to make sure we're getting the right candidates. That's one of the most important things in policing. Mm -hmm. People need to want to do the job of policing. It's not, first of all, it's not a very good paying job. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, so most people don't take it aspiring to be rich and famous, um, but we need to make sure that we're getting the top, the creme de la creme, the people that care about their community, want to give back to their community, that want to work in partnership with their community. And I think that's something that we had we lost for a while. I mean, I was saying, when I started as a police officer, my salary was $11.25 an hour. And that was in this century, folks. That's really sad to be a New York City cop right. and make less than I did when I worked at Starbucks in college. But I wanted the job because I loved the job. Um, but that's what we have to get back to. We have to make sure that we're changing this culture, that it's no longer us versus them, and that's what we had for the longest time. And that's how even some younger officers, when they come on, they want to come into this, you know, I say brotherhood, because that's what it was, but the brother and sisterhood of policing. Um, but we need to increase diversity in policing. We need to increase women representation in policing. Um, these are all really, really important things. And I think that um, if we start to, you know, tell people the great things about policing instead of like, oh, come and call her and make overtime. Like, you know, like that's what I was, that's how people tried to get me on. They're like, yo, you can make so much money if you call her someone because you'll make overtime. But we should be telling people that are aspiring to be law enforcement, hey, you know what, this is a great job because at the end of the day, you helped someone or you made someone feel safe. Um, so I think that's really something that we need to bring back into it, the positivity of policing. It's not just about going out, you know, playing cops and robbers and let me go get the bad guy all the time. It's half the time you're just talking to people. You're engaging in conversation. It's not all what we see on television. Tracy, we were at a, a police, BJA just released the police recruiting retention report from, and I haven't seen it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that struck me when we were there is how much we're still recruiting based on you know, 25 years ago when I was when I was policing, right? And and if you could wave your magic wand, how would you change it? And also thinking about the officer wellness perspective, I think this is the hard part for me. I retired in 2004. We are still dealing with the exact same problems yeah. on policing, recruiting, retention, officer wellness. That I don't. We're 20 years later and we have not improved the systems and understood that if you don't have well officers, 
you're going to get violence out in the street or violence in, in cops' communities, yeah. right? So let's start with that because, you know, when we came on, wellness was not an issue, right? So you were told, you know, this, if something happens to you, suck it up, go to work because we're short on cars today. That's right. And probably the number one issue for policing, not only is the culture itself, but is how you care for those. I mean, this is anybody who is an employer. How do you care for the folks who do the job that a lot of people don't want to do to your point? <laughs> And so the issue of wellness is one of the things that has to be more robust, right? So we still are a very masculine type of career, so we have to admit to that. But when we look at the science and we look at the studies, they'll tell you that having women, having people of color in there, really does change the dynamic and the narratives of how the culture of policing moves around, right? So there's an initiative called 30 by 30, and that is to increase the number of women in policing by 2030 because we know they have a different way of de-escalating. They are talkers, right? And they have a way to go in and not have to show physicality in such a way, yet policing rewards physicality. Right, so as we were sitting in BJA, and, and, and as you read the report, you'll see that one, that the sort of structure of policing is going to have to change. We've got new generations of kids, all who want to be of service, but the structure itself doesn't allow for that. You have shift work that's very restrictive. If you have a family, how do you do that? Because you can't move around. And so really, just I think to your point, is going back and looking at all of policing and what needs to happen in order to for our needs today. We need critical thinkers. We need people who have background in, uh, you know, in any accounting, right? We have all kinds of diverse personalities that are coming in that really do reflect the community, and it's very difficult to do that if you have systems that are refusing to change because people were rewarded and they did well under those old systems, right? But we can we can look at that and we can go back 30 years and I can tell you what it looked like. It was not diverse. It was not incorporating different voices. More so, it wasn't bringing in people from the communities we are trying to serve. That's right. The folks that live there and have grown up there, and one thing that I loved about New York, they came from everywhere. Yeah. And because they wanted to serve, and even from those communities we were trying to get to, because they had had an interaction with law enforcement that was positive, or they saw something in themselves that they knew they could contribute. And that's, for me, that is an important piece. But if you have that, and you get to that organization, and they squash it, and tell you, never mind, just fall in line with everybody else, then we're always going to have this problem. And, and the, what's interesting, because in my head, I, I think about how we evaluate police officers, mm -hmm. right? Is we don't necessarily evaluate police officers on the right metrics because we never have really understood the job in some aspects, right? And so we're promoting um, a lot. What has happened in the past is we tend to promote those hard chargers, the, the callers that are meaningless, <laughs> just because you have a lot of them or someone that gets told, you need to go out and make five stops, and they make 20 stops, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, they're a good police officer. But no one is looking at the quality <coughs> of the arrest, the quantities, you know, their, their outputs versus outcomes. And no one is talking to the community and surveying them about, how are you happy with your police agency? We you know, how did, how did this police officer do? So how do we change, and Jerron, for you, given, given your work, how do, how do we change the, the system of how we actually evaluate a police officer and, and, and create kind of like, there won't be a perfect police officer, but these are the skill sets that we want. Sure, so I'm gonna actually take it back to the, the trust building exercise, because, I mean, you can have police officers educate, but that don't mean people are gonna take it in. That's right. um, especially, and you gotta understand, it's 18,000 different police departments right. around the country. Um, and so these, it's, it's, it depends on what community you grow up in. I, I, can, I can tell you that it's education on both sides. You know, being a, a legislator, you know, or working in the Trump White House, you know, um, and sitting down with our White House counsel and all of our senior officials, um, once the George Floyd piece happened. And it was just like, well, we don't want to federalize the police. But I, I was able to give them perspective on profiling in America for black men. That's right. Which is a real thing. Um, I don't care if you're Tim Scott, you know, Cory right. Booker. That's you know, right. um, I don't care your title. If you're in a certain neighborhood, you know, and they're not used to seeing people who look like you in that neighborhood, you might get stopped. You know, um, and what do you do in that, in that, in that situation? You know, um, me, I've always been taught to kind of, I, I've been everywhere to like just, they ask me to lay out, I lay out. You know, but then there's some people, you, you got social media, they, they, they fight back, and then the next thing you know, it's a violent interaction, and then you have a person who didn't really even do a crime. 
Right. You know, um, and so that's that's a real cultural barrier. That's right. You know, um, and it literally took me two days of educating people <laughs> because they've never had to think of those type of things. You know, um, on, and so when you when you're talking about with certain communities, police educating, I think we need an exercise in the building trust. Like I think what you said about Jill about talking to people mm -hmm. is kind of like the first stop, the, the humanizing. You know, and the things that we have in common, um, and you know, the benefit of um, Chief Garcia and Anton Lucky before they started doing a partnership together. You know, Anton brought a group of OGs up to the police department, and they just talked for hours. Right. You know, um, and then realized that, like, look, we don't want bad police, and we also don't want uh, dangerous communities. That's right. You know, so how do we work together to make sure that happens? Um, and that partnership worked from building building from there. Um, and so I think that trust building exercise cannot be underestimated, you know, because you don't get the type of collaboration um, that can drive good outcomes. Um, and we're still in a data analytics world where we haven't really did the studying on what works. You know, it's like when we're like 10 years into that maybe. <laughs> That's right. And so, um, and, and I found that like when I was working on First Step Act, you know, the way we were measuring recidivism, we couldn't even really measure it because, you know, what is recidivism? You may not recidivate to the federal prison, but you might go to a local jail you know, or you might go to a state jail, you know. Um, and so it's a lot of work to do in that place. But we can't lose sight of the relational aspect, right. you know, the human aspect um, inside um, the police department as well as outside in the community. And I think that's where we probably need more leadership. We need leadership to kind of lean into these convenings because you know, a lot of people have opinions on Trump, but at least gave me the opportunity right. to kind of convene stakeholders that normally wouldn't meet. That's right. You know, um, I was able to write an executive order with the families who lost a loved one right. from a police interaction and also the sheriffs and, and, and uh, the US, um, the IACP, you know, um, and FOP. And we had very tough conversations over three days. But you know what? It created a, a, a paradigm where you saw agreement between the Trump administration and the Biden administration on approaches on how we police in the future. Um, but we have to do that tough work of relationship building um, in order to kind of have that educational piece where we can figure out the nuances of how we create something robust. Yeah, it, it's taking neighborhoods and communities and figuring out who the leaders are. The, right. the, and we do this in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know, you know that we have a lot of uh, informal leaders in law enforcement that can undermine any system that you're trying to change. Right. And if you don't get them on board, it's the same thing with the communities we serve. Um, I want to talk a little bit about alternative responses to policing. You know, one of the big things that's happening across the country right now are, are these very innovative, forward-thinking, um, not just police chiefs, but mayors and, and community stakeholders who are meeting across the country to say, what can we do to reduce the footprint of policing? Currently, I think that there's like 125 or over alternative responses to policing across the country that includes everything from community responders, mediation teams, mobile crisis teams, violence disruptors, post the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. How do, and, and my concern um, is that policing has a, a really bad habit sometimes of seeing the, the shiny object, right? And we don't ever do sustainable funding right. that actually keeps the shine on that program and when it doesn't create immediate results, we move on to the next thing or the next bit of funding because the federal government has a new funding. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, right now th they're willing to fund it, but is the next administration going to do it? And, and so how do we develop programs? You know, and CPE recently did a report. Can you talk a little bit about that well, and the results of we've it? We've done several reports. Yeah. So I hope you're talking about uh, the officers in schools. Um, it, yeah, so this one's about <laughs> the individual crisis teams. Yeah. So one of the things that we know is when you have alternatives to issues that are happening in your community, that it will not only save money, it will build trust. And so what we did is we looked at the different types of responses that are happening throughout the country. And we learned that oftentimes that the, these are what the community prefers. And it's not only what the community prefers, they're mostly the cheapest thing to fund. 
And when you don't, to your point, when you don't invest in those particular programs that you know work, then your only alternative is to go back to what you think you know. And we see that happening now, yep. where it's not fast enough. You know how it is. We wanted to have things fast enough. But we always appeal to everyone to know that we didn't get here overnight. And the ability for you to roll back what is happening is not going to happen overnight. But the consistent investment in the community and in the programs that we know work give you the outcomes that you're looking for. And that includes reducing recidivism. That also includes how, who's in, coming in contact with law enforcement and gives law enforcement enough time to do exactly what we want them to do. What I find interesting about the alternatives is that oftentimes we find educating people around what the alternatives will and will not do is the most critical part. A lot of times we want to put a lot of money in a lot of, you know, in a lot of different buckets, but they don't do exactly what we want them to do. And what we end up not doing is really focusing and investing on those programs we know that work. When you talk about violence disruptors, they will tell you a lot of them, and you know this, have been doing this work for decades. The battle has been the funding. And it, because it's non-traditional and because it may not line up for what you believe public safety or law enforcement to be, there's a reluctance to invest in those things. And I will tell you, if you're not investing in those things, I don't know what you're investing in. Because that is, and having a public, safe, having a public health lens is the other piece that will help you get to alternatives around that. So. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just add into that, the evidence-based piece 100%. is critical. Right. Because even in um, working with Cory Booker and Senator Scott, um, when, we, when we brought in law enforcement groups, there's a, a myriad of different ways to do violence interrupters programs. Right. And not all the different police groups agree on, on the methods, right. um, which is why we need to have evidence-based solutions that we, that we know work and invest in. But I'm not opposed to having those pilots out there right. so that we can get more um, evidence. Um, but I certainly think that we've seen Operation Ceasefire and some of these techniques come out of the um, notion around focused deterrence. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the paradigm that we're trying to create better funding models in. Um, but I also would argue that maybe we need to look at something more sustainable even with private sector funding that. because. Uh, there's a correlation between businesses and, and, and uh, small businesses being able to operate That's right. in these communities if right. they don't have um, a safe community. And so they're skin in the game. Um, and since we started working on second chances and doing reentry, you know, more private sector entities are in a position to see the correlation to why they should um, kind of work with law enforcement or community leaders to kind of create the right scenario. Um, and so. I think it's a, a not just an all of government approach towards this we need to have, but an all of community approach. Um, and I think that each um, segment of the community, including the private sector, could help us figure out proper responses and the, and the right data. And the narratives are important here, yeah. right? Because we often have the same narrative that communities that are the most vulnerable don't want to be safe. And that has never been the fact. Yeah. The question is, how do you define safety and how do you provide safety? And that's always been the way it has been. Well, I, I think polling shows us, and I think all our experience in policing and in policy shows us that communities, even marginalized communities that are the most underserved and the most impacted, because they're also underserved for health equity right. disparities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just policing. is. is I, I always get very frustrated when I talk to people and say, you know, health equity disparities are the exact same disparities that drive crime, That's right. Mm -hmm. right? And so we can't just solve crime with policing. It's an all private uh, public partnerships that, that are going to increase it. Jillian, you know, you, you've worked a lot of street crime teams, um, and we're seeing, you know, crime data now, right? For this year, at least, over 15,000 agencies actually submitted to, to NBIRDS, which um, is better than it was last year. So we're seeing a little bit. We saw murders decrease by 6.1, violent crime by 1.7, but 80.3% of all murders and manslaughters involved a gun and firearms were the most widely used types of weapons in violent offenses, of course, right? You know, how, how do we protect not just the community, but also our cops who are getting killed, right? Is And it's such a polarizing conversation when we start talking about guns, mm -hmm. because I believe, I, I, I have guns at home. You know, what? where's the role on appropriate regulation, and how do we continue to work towards 
mitigating the harms of guns in our society. I mean, I think I just saw something that our kids right. right now um, are being killed right and left. And if we can't save the future of our country, what are we doing? Well, I will say I'm happy that we saw, what was it, 62% compliance, I think, when reporting last year, we're over 83%. Yeah. Right. So that was pretty significant increase. Um, one of the reasons we didn't even see the reporting last year was because some of the agencies didn't even know how to do NIBRS. Right. They were like, I don't even know what this means. And they right. don't, I don't have the funding to hire the person to install the software. And, um, but to your point about the gun-related violence, most of my career I spent um, doing focusing on violent crime and felonies, um, doing the pretextual car stops in the hopes of ultimately getting the weapon off of the street. That was just how we did things. Um, but now we need officers to focus on that instead of all the other nonsense that we're doing, mm -hmm. the social service activities. I mean, cops aren't trained to do that. You're the marriage counselor. You're the person that has to go reprimand the right. kid who didn't want to eat their dinner. Or, or go to school. People, people <laughs> are literally, they call the cops for everything yeah. that's wrong in their life. And that's not what most of us signed up to do. We did sign up to protect the community yeah. and to make sure that we are getting the bad guys with the bad weapons, the illegal weapons off the street. But we're so, we're pulled in so many different directions because there's so many responsibilities placed on officers because it's really like who else are you going to call we're the only ones that have to go every time someone picks up the phone um, there's other people who are like oh yeah it's nine outside of nine to five Monday through Friday we don't have that luxury um, so I think maybe going back to what the root cause why we have police established in this country keeping the community safe stop taking the cops away, putting them on these, I don't like to say nonsense things, but most of what policing is now is nonsense. You're going to the stuff that no one else can deal with. Um, and now that's why we saw a violent crime increase because cops are being pulled in so many different directions. They're not allowed to focus on their number one job, which is keeping people safe. Yeah, I used to say this about federal incentives because I ran a drug squad. Mm -hmm. I had a <laughs> eight man multi-agency surveillance team and we did everything from career criminal and then uh, post 9-11, we did JTTF surveillance, which is a whole other story. But, um, you know, it, it becomes one of these things that I, that I think about is we fund drug seizures and civil asset forfeiture reform, but we don't fund rape That's right. uh, yeah. That's right. task forces That's or right. violent crime task forces. They're all tangentially related to other issues and it costs money mm -hmm. and you know and I and I think so much of the federal incentives in the past have been for the wrong things and it's just made policing for profit really perverse yeah. you know the fines the fines and fees in you know California the fines and fees have been a nightmare red light violation cost me a thousand dollars a red light camera I got two in like three months for right turns twenty five hundred dollars and then, you know, and it was horrible, but I always think about the people who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. They ignore it, they go to warrant, they get stopped, they lose their license, their car gets taken away. And those, you know, those are the things in policing that drive me nuts. Those aren't necessarily creating safety. That's right. Yeah. Well, see, the, the, the interesting thing is that what I end up learning is that out of the 18,000 police departments, it's mm -hmm. probably only four to 5,000 I even try to get the government funding because many police de um, departments don't want to have that dependency. That's right. right. You know, um, our coalition thinks that um, one issue, which is the proper form of government that should be funded, is public safety. Um, and so we, we do believe and try to advocate to try to get that funding on the local level and then thinking about creative ways to kind of create a relationship with the community to sustain um, officers um, in the future. But to their point, the other piece that we're, we're missing is that some of these officers get overworked just because um, we're not holding some criminals accountable in the system. And so you can arrest someone, but then someone will be right back out on the street. Um, and in many cases, uh, you know, like 20% of people are doing 80% of the crime. Police know exactly who they are, um, but they're also dealing with the issue of, you know, people constantly reoffending and not being held accountable. And so I think with, with all the things that we're trying to promote around evidence-based policy, if we lean into that all above approach, you know, these things kind of fix each other. So like you have police spending less time you know, on, on chasing the same person if you can keep them arrested. And so then you need less money to do it. 
And then also, if you're doing a proper co-responder models, then they can focus on the violent crime and solving for them. Um, if you build those relationships with the community, then you get more intel um, from the community on who are the bad guys, because they're helping you um, chase those bad guys. And then more importantly, if, if, if the local mayor and the, um, the, the biggest companies in that community are making an investment, then we're creating jobs and opportunities so people don't even think about doing crime because they're living such a good life you know, with, with their job and being able to feed their family um, and getting the education they need. So these are like the holistic approaches. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy that in, with all the things going on in America, we can't be very intentional about these issues. You know, um, we, we get here and, and uh, you can find the number one trending issue is usually sports and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> but like we can fix these issues um, with, the, with the right leadership and, and people committed to just doing it. You know, um, not because of the politics, because people need it, you know, um, and you can't get all the other things with revitalizing communities if you don't have public safety. Yeah, right. um, Tracy and Julian, I have this question for you. This, this, cause this is such a cop question, which is, um, Cops hate the status quo. <laughs> they hate change. And oh my gosh, do we hate change. Yeah. You know, so the struggle in policing is culture, right? So much, you know, and the, the adage of culture eats policy is so true. How do, how do we change? How do we uplift culture? Because and, and if, we can, if we can fix that, I think so much is, is going to be changed towards policing in the community as well. Agreed, agreed. And I think that what's interesting about culture, there's some parts of policing culture you want to hold on to. Some of it you don't. You yep. want it to go. But one of the things I will tell you is we, you know, as cops are, right, we can't even decide on where to go to dinner if there's more than two of us. <laughs> but there's this notion, though, that, you know, as I said, as I was going through the ranks, cops don't make policy. Yeah. And typically what happens is they're being told to do something that they themselves will tell you is going to create a problem for me if I do this in the community, and yet no one is listening to that. The start is really with educating, but actually communicating with those who are on the street, and sitting with them, and walking them through, and what's interesting, I don't know about you, but my chief never asked me anything. If they did, it was after the fact, it was already decided, but really getting that knowledge and saying, hey, look, we're looking about, we're gonna do X. Tell me what you think the issues are going to be if we, do, we go and do these. Cops will tell you. You ask them anything, they will tell you what they think, mm -hmm. right? And yet we still don't want to do that. We, yeah. for some reason, want to go ahead. And this, is, this was Ferguson. This was Stop, Question, and Frisk. Believe me, folks were being told, if you don't do X, you're not getting Y, yeah. right? And when you're trying to take care of your family and you're trying to you know, get paid, what do you think you're going to do? And I think if we start really, a lot of culture and policing really needs to flip itself on its head. And if we're truly going to be those kind of leaders, then that means that you lead everyone, but you hear from everyone as well. And you don't make decisions on high and then come down and say, do it. And a lot of folks, not, you know, and I was one of them, if you've forgotten what the street feels like and you have yeah. not been back to the street, then you cannot make proper policy. Yeah. And you are going to have to make sure that everyone who we want engaged in this is truly engaged from the community, from the officer on the street, that recruit that's working the overnight shift. You're gonna have to hear from everybody. And so I think that parts of the culture we do wanna hold on to, but a lot of it we don't. They're old narratives. They're things we passed on in the academy. It would, it's what makes policing sexy, right? right? I can tell you the thing that I was attracted to was driving fast, yeah. <laughs> right? It, was, it wasn't shooting, it was driving fast. Getting going down a highway at 90 miles an hour. It's like, this is awesome. Repelling, I have pictures of me repelling. You know, right? Yeah, it was fabulous. But Chilling. we have to go back to what is the role of policing? Yeah. Who do we want here? But we also have to think about how are we leading these same men and women, and those who don't identify, how are we leading them? How are we getting that information back and how are we truly using it? So. I think what you just said is so spot on. So I never, none of my bosses ever came and said, what do you think about this? You're the one out there doing the job every day. I'm the one sitting in the office putting in for more promotions for myself. But you don't, you know, we don't listen to those important people. Like those are the ones that have the knowledge, that are the ones talking to the members of the community, that hear the complaints, and then are on top of it forced to do some of the enforcement that we don't even agree with. That's because right. some of it's just dumb, to be honest yeah. with you. I used to think it was the dumbest thing to, we would lock up people who had a cardboard box house because they were unhoused individuals. We would get told, you have to go under the little overpass on Bruckner and go lock them up. I'm like, what is that gonna solve? Right. Um, but yes, 
we're at time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can go all day. I'm, I'll leave it to like last thoughts for anyone that wants yeah, to. Jerome, I'll give you last thoughts and really want to thank every, this panel. It was it was great. Every time I, I sit down and have conversations like this, I learn so much. No, I mean, I, I think I've wrapped up a lot of the things that, that I was saying, but you know, I, I, I honestly have had a different, different experience with law enforcement groups. Um, many of them have actually wanted to come to the table and think mm -hmm. about new ways to reform the system. Um, I think that at the end of the day, um, those law enforcement officials care about public safety. Um, and, and, I, and I feel the same way from community leaders. Um, community leaders um, realize that they, they do need police and, and they want safe communities. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's there, it's just the appetite to actually do the work right. and building the trust is what's needed. And I think for all of the people in the audience that are um, looking at helping modernize and reform, we can all um, play a role in helping bring people to the table. Absolutely, thank you very much. And I'll just end it with criminal justice transformation is a nonpartisan issue and we need every single one of you at the table with us. Thank you. Thank you.